Now, the reason I came is, and I, I should finish the one point of it and come back to you twice. The reason I started down this road is when I opened the kitchen, I sat back waiting for the phone to ring. I love media, and I'm good at it. And I was correct. Every media out in the world wanted to come, and I sat back waiting for the phone to ring, knowing in my heart that what I was doing was resonating with sick people in Washington. And I fully expected, and I got calls from people saying, I want to donate food. I mean, I love what you're doing. I want to donate money. I want to come down and volunteer. I got all that. But you know what? What I totally didn't expect, it totally ruined my day, was the real face of hunger. I mean, honestly, I was so naive. I thought hunger was about homeless people out on the street. And what I got was a thousand calls from people saying, hey, man, my mother is at home, um, and she's got to choose between heating oil and food. Can you help her out? And it's like, oh, my God, I didn't think about the ceiling. Come to find out there's a waiting list for Meals on Wheels today and half of American cities. Think about that. Civil rights pioneers. Men and women fought in foreign wars for the freedom to enjoy today. You know, women who went charging in the 1950s and this into the marketplace trying to fight for equal pay, waiting in line for food right now as we speak. I got a call from people saying, man, I work and I got two jobs and I'm not home till six and my kids after school program, there's no snack. Can you do a snack there? And I thought, I never thought about kids. You know, I never thought about working women. You know, I thought hunger was about unemployment. I didn't think it was about underemployment. So all of a sudden I realized, man, I don't care how big my machine is, I can't meet that need. But I realized if I could use my machine to draw America into this discussion about not how do we feed our elders, but how do we show respect for our elders, that's the discussion I want to have. So I was on that journey, working hard, and that's when I met Carol Lanier here in Texas who was showing, in my, in my way of thinking, amazing vision because she was fighting uphill battle and people, she was talking about a, 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 a dehydration plant, which is now, I love it, the deep the breed love dehydration plant. No one had remotely even thought of dehydrating food. And she had got Ann Richards, the governor at the time, to incentivize truckers to send all their stuff to um, Lubbock. And they actually now freeze dry, I think, about 40,000 pounds of food a day. It's an incredible program, but there was this amazing vision. And I mean, it really intrigued us because coincidentally, as a young man, I met a guy, a friend of mine, who called himself a futurist. And I'm like, futurist? What's that? That sounds like Star Trek. What is it? You know, but really, it's just somebody sees trends. It's somebody who sets out and says, what's coming? And how can we do something today to be prepared or even march out to meet the future? And again, a classic example of this is, you know, when I started really thinking about seniors in America, the reality of like, wow, in 1996, there's a waiting list. For, for meals on wheels, 1996, there's 80 million of my generation coming. You know, by the way, you know, six, I'm 12,000 people a day turn 60 in America. Then if we were smart, we'd go over to Cable, Cable Factory. That's where the money is. Can you imagine that? 12,000 people coming to the waiting list today, and we've all seen the reports food bank shelves are empty. And that's legal. You know, and there's no big pot of, of food we haven't figured out. So we have to have a very different discussion. But what really got me on this journey, quite frankly, is, um, you know, I'm a modest, modest um, historian. I'm a full-time lifelong learner, but I mean, I'm a modest, I love history, love history. And I was reading a little book um, on Indian independence. I'm actually quite mesmerized by independence movements, and I read quite often about men and women who have led independence movements, and what got men and women to the point where they were ready to stand up and walk together. I was reading about Indian independence when I read the, the, the craziest little footnote I mean, a little teeny footnote in a bottom of the page that said the British never, ever had more than 3,000 officers stationed on the ground in India. Now, again, we're in an age where numbers, we're talking about trillions and billions of numbers, and sometimes roll off. You really can't grasp numbers, you know. But that really made me stop and really stop and think of it. 3,000 white dudes, 350 million people, the entire subcontinent, two centuries. How they do that. Now, again, my father was a Marine, so I understand command structure, but I was mesmerized by this equation. I couldn't figure out the math. So I decided, man, road trip, I'm going to India. Um, anybody been to India? India's crazy, isn't it? Man, India is extraordinary. It's not fun, but it's extraordinary. Everybody should really consider a trip. But I went there and allowed myself 30 days, one month, to dig into India to figure this out. Now, I'll be honest with you. I fully expected this to be almost like the Da Vinci Code. You know, I figured there was some kind of secret incantation, and I'd be running around the bowels of Plum Bay, you know, trying to find all this stuff. And I allowed myself again 30 days, but you know what? Day one. Day one, I figured it out. And I 
had my last time left. I was in Nehru's home. And what I stumbled upon, and it was right in front of my face, but you know, it was basically as long as the British could keep Indians divided by race, caste, class, geography, or language, and fighting one another, it was a piece of cake. What made me laugh that very day was I realized that's the nonprofit sector in America. <laughs> this is us. And on that very day, I swore I refused to fight with you for money. I gave up that thing. I refused. I refused to go hard against AIDS, housing against hunger, you know, all these little things. I refused to play this game anymore. That's when I came up with this idea for the nonprofit Congress. When you think about it, it's the Indian National Congress, nonprofit Congress. But this idea of what would it be like if, like Indians, if like African Americans, if like Morgan farm workers, we could find common ground. Again, never forget Gandhi, Dr. King, and Cesar Chavez. You know, when you talk about leadership, what they got was people to realize we have more in common. And when they found that common ground, they realized that if you don't buy salt, which only costs pennies, the machine stops. If we don't ride the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and it only costs one thin dime to ride the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, but if all of us don't ride the bus, the machine stops. Table breaks. Cesar Chavez used table breaks and said if we don't buy as a country table breaks in a younger generation, those young men and women with audience over 40, they're the generation who really led the effort to, to boycott table breaks so that the migrant farm workers had the ability to get their kids decent education, sanitary conditions, and a future in this country. Many men and women that have assumed major roles in our society's economy now are the sons and daughters of those early migrant farm workers. But they use these simple things, breaks, dimes, and salt, with the idea of unity. So it came back to many this idea of like, what would it be like if the nonprofit sector, as divergent as we are, we're talking, of course, universities, art galleries, hospitals, your programs, mine. But what would it be like if the nonprofit sector could find common ground? Now you know what's interesting, coincidentally, I came back from India, and what I did is just a little bit of research and found that if you took what we collectively, again, what the nonprofit sector in America, what we generate in our annual income, do you realize economically we're bigger than India? I say this every speech I make. Do you realize that if the nonprofit sector in America were a country, we would most likely have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council? <laughs> Yet we don't have a say in the smallest town policy process. That's why I'm here today. That's why I've been on this journey. Now, again, when I came back, we had the first nonprofit Congress, and the task of that Congress was to help people over this hump, over this divide, and said, the nonprofit sector is too divergent to find common ground. Again, we, we don't have anything in common, the university and the soup kitchen. And what we found at the nonprofit Congress when we came up with were three different ideas. And by the way, there were some people here who were at the nonprofit Congress. There were some delegates from Texas here from the nonprofit Congress that I see some people. There's one of you. I know I've talked to a few people already who were there. But the idea was, one, first thing, we get no in-depth analysis of what we do. Think about that, $12 billion a year. In Texas alone, $300 billion in the American economy was donated to charity. Yet no newspaper really has in-depth daily analysis of what we do. My paper, the Washington Post, I love reading it every day. You know, they have two full-time people. Their job is to say good restaurants, bad restaurants. They have two people saying good movies, bad movies. They just dedicated a page to good video games, bad video games. But they have nothing, nothing. And again, get this, we are one-tenth of the American economy. 14 million workers, 80 million volunteers, $3 trillion in assets, $300 billion in annual revenue. And if you walk down the street of any city in America and stop 10 people and say, what's a good nonprofit? Seven would look like, I don't, I don't know. Two would look like they do, but they were afraid of being wrong. And one, one would say with a big fat smile, oh, it's the one with the lowest administrative overhead. And they told them, now again, man, I know that is funny, but think about how tragic this is. And again, really look at it in the frame of the broader economic climate in which we find ourselves. One-tenth of our American economy in this deep recession, and we don't know what, a good, what we're doing with it. We don't know what's good or bad. And that is the second thing we have in common. Again, we are defined, doesn't matter how big or small, we're defined by the flawed barometer of, inter, of, of administrative overhead. 